Once I'd seen the councillor, I'd pretty much uh, all but signed on the, the dotted line um, pending um, the examination by the optometrist. Um, that examination uh, seemed quite brief and not much different to a thorough eye test with the use of um, blurring drops. Again, I re-emphasised my concern over my dry eyes to, to the um, optometrists <clears throat> and I suggested to him that he took a look at my optician's notes to determine the extent of my problem. Um, naively, I guess, um, I'd assumed that it would be normal procedure to do this in the same way as the GP notes would be obtained before a surgical procedure. Um, I'd given them my um, optician's details, so that would not have been a problem. <clears throat> But he totally dismissed my um, dry eyes as not been a problem um, and concluded that after the exam that I was um, concluded after the exam that I was an ideal candidate for surgery. So I returned to the counsellor and completed the finance documents. Although after the blurring drops, I couldn't really see what I was signing. Um, I was given a glossy folder containing the same information as you could be found on the website. Um, a list of do's and don'ts before and after surgery um, and emergency contacts for any post-surgery concerns. Um, but crucially, no consent form outlining the potential complications of surgery. <clears throat> I was very excited at the prospect. I fully trusted the professionalism and integrity of the counsellor and the optometrist. After all, they were they were trained and highly experienced, and this is what they did every day. Um, they were medical professionals and so would have the best interests of their patients at heart, wouldn't they? Um, I did not even consider for one minute that this might not be the case. Um, it wasn't something that even crossed my mind um, until more than a year or so after surgery. But hindsight is a wonderful thing. I know now, at great cost to my eyesight, that I was not suitable for surgery, um, and this fact is supported by the observations of two independent surgeons. <clears throat> I have copies of my Optical Express patient print pack, and clearly logged are the references to dry eyes and contact lens intolerance. I'm now aware that this combination along with my expressed concerns, should have rang alarm bells um, as these are contraindicators to LASIK. However, the alarming fact is that the optometrist logged a tear breakup time of 12 seconds um, but didn't even see fit to make a co any comment on this. Um, conveniently, um, anything over 10 is regarded as normal. <coughs> Firstly, I don't, I don't recall the optom doing a slit lamp test, but even if he did, um, a reading of 12 seconds would be totally inconsistent with what I was telling him about my dry eyes. I hadn't had a tear breakup time anywhere near 10 in, in over six years, so why would I all of a sudden have a count of 12 seconds now? Um, if I was the optom, common sense would tell me that this looked odd. Um, and I would say something like, gosh, your tear breakup time is good today, or um, your eyes don't, appear to, don't appear, as, appear to be as dry as you are telling me, um, or when did you use wetting drops last? Or he might have considered, I, I realise that breakup time can be affected by temperature and humidity, so I better retest just, in, just to be on the safe side. And then we'll make a decision based on that retest and what we find in your optician's notes. Um, but he did, no, he did none of this. This, of course, presumes that 12 seconds was a true reading in the first place. Um, I don't think it po possibly could be. But, of course, I cannot prove it because I did not see what he was logging in my notes. Um, and he didn't offer any comment. I truly believe that the optom's approach was totally gung-ho. He was making decisions on my eyesight and yet he did not take the time to do the proper checks. I believe he totally failed in his duty of care to me. I believe he totally ignored my concerns about my dry eyes. I can only surmise that he thought the surgeon 
would perhaps pick up on it before operating, which in my case, and to my cost, he did not. I've come across uh, suggestions that optoms at Optical Express are paid according to targets based on the number of patients that are suitable for surgery. <clears throat> the job advertisements certainly seem to support this, putting commercial acumen and influencing skills above patient care. <clears throat> I've written to David Molesdale um, asking him to comment on this, but unsurprisingly he's declined. So I'll have to leave it to you to decide. If it's true that, that optoms are financially in incentivised to pass patients as suitable for surgery, then this, of course, should raises major issues as there is a clear dilemma between patient care and financial reward, which should never arise in the medical profession. As regards the counsellor, or more appropriately, uh, the saleswoman, I have my doubts that she was qualified to make decisions on the appropriate procedure for me. I believe she should have been truthful about the potential complications of surgery rather than completely downplay them. I believe it was a blatant lie to tell me that surgery would alleviate my dry eyes. In fact, um, I've been told by an independent surgeon that this is the most stupid thing he has ever heard in his years of experience. I believe she failed to oversee the proper completion of my medical questionnaire. I believe she totally down, over, totally over-egged the pudding as regards the benefits of surgery. I also should believe she should have given me a consent form outlining complications to take away and mull over. I now have my doubts whether she herself had surgery at all and whether this was just a sales ploy. I wonder whether and to what extent the whole consultation was influenced by financial incentive. In the next instalment, I'll um, describe my first surgery day. <clears throat>